We thank our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one and only, the only way, the only truth, and the only life, the only true divine God who was revealed in the flesh over 2,000 years ago. There is no other God but Him. This is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is God, if you ever make an oath in a courthouse. Well, beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, faithfuls, both in this holy church and every beloved soul who is watching us through live streaming, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that you're always in good health and in good spirit, built on the rock, the never shaking, and never breaking, the rock of salvation and the rock of all ages, as the Holy Bible tells us through, their, through its prophecies, the rock being Christ himself. I pray that you're always built on this rock for the Lord to sustain you, to keep you and protect you and deliver you from the snares of the enemy, whether it be visible or invisible in his mighty and awesome name. Amen. Today, according to our beloved church calendar and tradition, it is the end of the fasting period of the apostles, the Lent of the apostles, the 12 and the 70. If you're not aware, when the Lord Jesus was still on earth, he chose 12 apostles and thereafter 70. And today is the end of the feast. They also fasted 40 days like their master did while he was on earth in the flesh. So those who were fasting, may the Lord Jesus accept your fasting. And today, after the Holy Mass service, you can break your fast and have your uh, fish burger on a chocolate sundae. I don't know why I always promote Maccas and they, ne they never pay me for it. I'm going to send them the bill and it's going to be a hefty one too. For all these years, I'll backdate it. They'll have to pay me $5 million because we need to build a church. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was just a hint. <laughs> all right. Um, the gospel for today, uh, our church fathers are also... Today is a tradition in our church which we call in, in Aramaic Syriac, Nu Serd El. Nu Serd El, which literally transliterates into the Feast of God. Nu Serd El, back in the Middle East, probably some of you here are familiar with it. On this day, we used to go out and sprinkle water on one another. It may look kind of crazy from an uh, outside sort of point of view but it's absolutely magnificent and the uh, the sprinkling of the water um, is traditional in the church and it goes actually all the way back to one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus since it is the end of their feast today and that disciple is of the 12 being Saint Thomas Saint Thomas went out of Israel Jerusalem he went to another neighboring country called Iran, Persia. So he went to Iran, Persia, and he started preaching the gospel to the Persian people. And when you read his biography, it says that thousands upon thousands upon thousands came and accepted Jesus Christ of Nazareth as their Lord and Savior, as they do now as we speak when he went to Iran he visited the whole country and went more so to a, a beautiful city called Urmia and I, I know there are some beautiful people from Iran originally from Iran and they can relate to what I'm saying now so they went to he went to Urmia and in Urmia there is a small sea when St. Thomas saw all these thousands of people coming to receive the Lord, he needed to baptize them. If he was to do it one by one, submerging and all that, probably he would still be going till now. 
So he said, I need to take a shortcut. There is thousands upon thousands. I don't have the time. I need to move on. And St. Thomas ended up being a martyr in India. In India, he was martyred. He was killed for the sake of the Lord Jesus by the Hindus. So when the thousands came, he took him to the Sea of Urmia and he brought him to the shores and he said, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and he would sprinkle water on all of them and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. That sprinkling of the water, that tradition of St. Thomas, till this very day we celebrate. 2,000 years of history. Amazing. Now that's one. Now, biblically speaking, water resembles the Word of God. When the Lord Jesus met that Samaritan woman at the well, when we read it in the Gospel according to St. John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus said, Woman, if you ask of me, I will give you the living waters where you thirst no longer. He was referring to his word, the Holy Bible. The word of God is that like that water. It quenches the thirst, thirst and it puts a smile when the water is sprinkled on your face as we will be doing shortly to every single one of you. So I hope you didn't take a shower because you'll get a free one this evening by the best looking bishop in the entire universe. Did I say the universe? Oops. <laughs> I think the Lord is going to smack me now. He said, okay, you're good looking for Fairfield area only, okay? <laughs> Don't go outside of your LGA. <laughs> uh, where are you going to find a bishop like this? Man, it's stunning. <laughs> so anyway, the water resembles his word. You know, when, 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 you, when somebody sprinkles water in your face, naturally, without even thinking about it, you get startled and there is a humongous smile on your face. Humongous smile. Look in the mirror and while I sprinkle the water on you. You'll notice that very clearly. Now it puts a smile. That water puts a smile on your face and the word of God, when you accept it, it puts, puts a humongous smile on your heart. And then reflects on your face. The word of God is that it's like that sprinkled water that brings joy, happiness, and comfort. So today is Nusert El. El in Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac means God. Nusert El, the feast of God. The gospel of today, our church fathers have chosen two separate parts from the gospel according to Saint Luke. It is one, one part is from chapter 10, verses 15 to 24, and the other part is from, uh, from chapter 14, verses 1 to 15. So the Lord sent the 70 disciples to go and preach the gospel. They came back rejoicing. They said, Lord, even, even demons sub are submissive to us. When we order them to leave, they leave on the spot. The Lord replied and said, he said, I saw Satan falling from the sky from heaven like a lightning. But let me tell you, my dear disciples, do not rejoice that even demons listen to you, but rejoice when your names are written in heaven. But rejoice more so when your names are written in heaven. And then the Lord goes on and says, when you're invited to a banquet, a wedding, do not take the high place. Lest you take it and then the one who invited you comes and says to you, my friend, this place is not for you. It is for someone else here more honorable than you. And then you'll get up, put to shame in front of everyone and walk and take the lowest part in that banquet. He says, when you're invited, Go and sit right at the back, the furthest spot, the lowest spot, sit there and then let the one who invited you walk up to you and says, why are you sitting here, my dear friend? 
get up and elevate yourself. Then you will get up with glory before everyone who is invited and take a higher place. Because the Lord continues and says, because he who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Humility. Do not rejoice because demons listen to you, but rejoice when your names are written in heaven. When your names are written in heaven. And take the lowest place. Humble yourself. The Lord is trying to say to us this. Do you love me? It's a question. It's a question the Lord asked Simon Peter after his resurrection. Yet Simon Peter denied the Lord both in his divinity and humanity. So the mistake, the sin of Simon Peter was much greater than Judas Iscariot, if you are not aware. The sin of Simon Peter was much greater than Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot never denied the deity of Christ, yet Simon did with an oath. He swore he does not know this man, yet in Matthew 16, 16 to 18, he says, you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. He accepted, acknowledged, confessed, and professed his divinity and humanity, yet before a woman denied them both. Judas never did that. So when the Lord rose from the dead, he calls him, Simon, son of Jonah, come here. Simon thought he was going to put him to shame. Simon thought the Lord was going to wipe the floor with him. He was going to destroy him before everyone. But to his shocking surprise, the Lord says to Simon, do you love me? He said, what? You know, Lord. I love you. The question is, do we love the Lord? Well, the Lord says, if you love me, then you should not be focused on demons being submissive to you. You should not be focused on miracles being done to you. You should not be focused when you preach and the whole world listens to you. You should not be focused on anything you do achieve. Focus on your love for Christ because unless you are focused on Christ, even if you raise the dead, you're nothing. You're nothing. It is not the miracle that makes you someone special. It is the love of God for you when you acknowledge it, when you live it, when you taste it and share it with everyone and when you give it back to God, then you are special. Then your name is written in heaven. Judas Iscariot was one of the disciples who casted demons out of people. Judas Iscariot was one of the disciples who did wonders and miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus, yet he ended up hanging himself, committing suicide, and losing his portion, his good portion, Christ the Lord. You see, the Lord is saying, you do not have a name in heaven until the focus becomes me not the miracle. One day, the Lord put this piece of dust, this sinner, and the greatest sinner of all, to the test. A time came where I was dying to be a priest, not a bishop, priest. A time came I was a deacon, and the opportunity came for me to be a priest. My entire hope, my entire thinking, all of me was dying just to be a priest. Two days left to the ordination, I got kicked out from the church. 
And I'm used to being kicked, punched. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice being a punching bag. I got kicked out. Two days left for my ordination as a priest. My entire dream gone with the wind in a split second. I was shocked. Six years later, the same people ordained me a priest. Two years after that, I was ordained a bishop. Two years after that, I got kicked again. I did not understand at the beginning. Lord, wasn't it you who put that idea for me to be longing for the priesthood rank? Yes, I was. Because everything good comes from the good God. It is, I, I don't have that enough intelligence for me to choose what is God's path and what is God's deed. It's beyond our intellectual capacity. So it's a gift, it's a touch, it's a grace from the Lord for you to realize and wake up and say, yes, I wish to be a priest. Yes, I wish to be a nun. Yes, I wish to be a monk. Yes, I wish to be a bishop. Yes, I wish, I wish. It's a touch of grace from the Lord himself. So Lord, since you put it in my heart to long for the priesthood rank, why did you not let it happen at the time? He taught me and made me understand six years and more later. The Lord is patient. He doesn't rush things. Yes, we want him to be done right now. He came and said, I wanted to teach you a lesson, and this is for all of us, my beloveds. Each one of us, we share the same principle, but different colors. Whatever you're wishing for, it's a wish. I wish for a priesthood, you wish to get married. You wish to be a businessman. You wish to be a doctor. It's the same principle, different colors, but it's the same principle. He said, every good gift is from me because I am the good God. I am the good shepherd. I am Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only true God. So I gave it to you, but I did not let you to have it at the time you wanted it. I was going to give it to you when I choose the time, not you. Why, Lord? He said, because I want you to know one thing. Even though I give you the gift of priesthood, I do not want you to focus on the priesthood. I want you to focus on the one who gave it to you. Aha. The Lord gave me a high place. Will I be now boastful about it and be a show off? Will I now seek your attention and make sure that you are focused on me? You say nice things to me. You come and ask for my counsel and advice. No, when you come, I'll say to you, you are coming to Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the way you're meeting this King of Kings when you come and see his donkey, and the king sitting on that back of that donkey. I am nothing but that donkey. Don't ever focus on the donkey. Otherwise, you are extremely ignorant people. Focus on the king. What is the donkey going to do for you? Can't even do anything for itself, let alone for you. And speaking of donkey, it's a joke. You know, when the Lord entered Jerusalem sitting on the back of a donkey, it was a mule, but that's not our topic. So anyway, it's a donkey. So that was on Palm Sunday. Yes, we celebrate that in the church. So the following day, Monday, the day after Palm Sunday, the very donkey which the Lord sat on its back was walking with another friend donkey on the same road. And the donkey that which the Lord sat on its back, said to the other donkey, he said, my friend, it's very weird today. The other guy said, what's so weird? 
He said, you have no idea. Yesterday, there was a humongous multitude, thousands of people standing on the other side of the road, shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were throwing palms, branches on the road, clothes, everything, and young and old. Everyone was shouting Hosanna. Today, unbelievable, dear donkey. I'm walking on the same path. There is not even one person saying anything. The other donkey said, you are truly a donkey. <laughs> Do you think those people yesterday came out shouting Hosanna for you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're a donkey, okay? They came for the king who was sitting on your back. For the king. You're a donkey. No matter what we do and what we achieve and what horizons we reach, all glory, all honor, all worship and praise must be given to the one and only Jesus Christ of Nazareth because this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. And why the Lord is asking us, do we love him? Because the only time you will do wonders in his name and never take credit for it is when you truly love the Lord from the heart. Why? Because when you love someone from the heart, whatever you do, you do it for them, not for you. Isn't it? You want me to tell you the secrets? This girl fell in love with this guy and he happened to be the sweet Jono and poor Rachel now she has lost everything because of falling in love whatever you do and whatever you say it is all about your sweetheart nothing about you isn't it mm -hmm. they come on tell me the Lord says, if you truly love me, then you do it for me, not for you. Love is never selfish. Love equals sacrifice. Love equals sacrifice. You love, you give your life for the one you love. And isn't that in the matrimonial bond when this beautiful couple are standing before the holy altar and the priesthood rank and the priest comes to the to the to the man to the boy and he says um will you take her in good times and in bad times in sickness and in health in richness and in poorness yeah 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 father and then will you take him in good times and bad times sickness and in health and richness and yeah, 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 father the plane is waiting we go into hawaii for honeymoon come on hurry up oh please don't call the bishop to do the wedding ceremony we'll be sleeping in the church the wedding ceremony went for, uh, for 40 minutes and he spoke for four hours. <laughs> Some people are laughing because they are in line. <laughs> I'll be marrying you. <laughs> okay, so please, you know, make sure your, um, your reception can wait, <laughs> you know. Very good. Um, so you give your life. You live no longer for you, but for the one you love the most. So the Lord is saying, I gave you gifts to cast out demons. I gave you gifts to heal the sick, the leper, the blind, the crippled, the paralyzed. I gave you all those gifts. When I gave you the gifts and you performed them, did you feel good about yourself? Or did you give all the credit to the one who gave you those gifts? It's hard. It's hard not to be boastful. You see, you're coming to see, you're seeing the bishop, not Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> yo, what's up, brother? You're seeing the bishop, but I need to remind myself, this is the love of Christ for me and for you that does the wonders and the miracles. It is the love that makes your name written in heaven. And this is where St. Paul puts it so eloquently. It's like an orchestra playing better than Beethoven and Bach. 1 Corinthians 13, he says, 
if I give all of my wealth to the poor, and if I cast myself into the fire and have no love, I am nothing. He's not talking about any love. He's talking about the true divine love which St. Paul came to have an encounter with called Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And this is why he said, I will not boast, but I will boast only with Jesus Christ being crucified. Because this is the true divine love revealed in the making to the human race. It's up to you to accept it. So now, do not rejoice because demons, even demons, listen to you. But rejoice more when your names are written in heaven. And the only way your names for them to be written in heaven, when you give the love back to your heavenly Father, who sent you his beloved Son to sacrifice him on the cross, to redeem you, save you, and bring you back home safe and sound. You need to love God and give that love back to him in order to guarantee your name written in heaven. Miracles you do get you nowhere. It is the love that is the miracle of all miracles. Lazarus was raised by the Lord himself. And if people think raising a dead is the ultimate miracle, well, it's not. Because the one whom the Lord himself raised, he died again in Cyprus. Go to Cyprus, his, his grave is there. So raising the dead ends up being dead. But what made Lazarus come out of the grave forever? The Lord's love for him. Because it takes love to change a person's heart. And until your heart is changed, you are not living, you're dead. Even if you are living, you're dead. But when the heart is changed by God, then you live forever. You will never die. And that's why he goes and says, when you're invited somewhere, sit at the back. The lowest place, the least of all. Why? Because he says, since you answered the question which I asked you earlier, do you love me? And since you said, you know, Lord, I love you. So since you love me, then I am in you. I'm dwelling in your heart. I'm dwelling inside of you. Since I'm dwelling inside of you, wherever you go, Christ is with you. Therefore, wherever you sit, that place becomes number one. It is not the place that makes Jesus number one. It is the Lord Jesus who makes the place number one. So whether you sit at the front or sit at the back, wherever you sit, when Christ is in you, that place becomes number one. What's your problem? And this is why the Lord chose to be born in a manger, in a place where animals dwell, not humans. He could have very easily he could have been born in Caesar's palace. He could have been born in Caiaphas' house. He could have been born in a very rich family. But he, out of all of Bethlehem, out of all of Bethlehem, he was not born in any house. He was born in a place where animals live. Why? To say that I make the place number one, even if it's a manger. And I will make sure, since I'm born in it, I'll make sure the whole world will come and lick the dust of that manger. And they do. Till this day. They go bow and kiss the ground where the Lord was born. They lick the dust of the land. The least of all places became the number one. Because the number one and the only one, Jesus Christ, God revealed in the flesh, was born in that place. He turned the place from last to number one. So, when you're invited, don't look for a high place. Don't look for a big throne. Sit on the ground. And I always say this. Have you ever heard somebody sitting on the ground and falling? Who falls? The one that climbs very fast and jumps the steps. 
But if you sit on the ground, it's the safest place, my dear friend. You'll never fall. You sit on the ground and let God lift you up. Don't try it your way because you will fail miserably. And someone that is very proud of themselves and they think they're someone special, I can assure you the image is very ugly. When you force it, it's ugly. Just be simple, humble. Let God exalt you. Amen. Um, the Lord Jesus chose 12 and then 70 disciples. Um, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just for your own information, Matthew and John are of the 12. Mark and Luke are of the 70. The Lord is saying, all of you to me are one. There is no difference. I love you equally. That's why I chose from the 12 and the, from the 70 to say, for, you, for me, all of you are one. I do not differentiate. I don't have favorites. Everyone is number one. That's why the church is called the church of the firstborn. The church is called the church of the firstborn. Who is the firstborn? The number one. So when Simon Peter came and was baptized in Jesus' mighty name, he was number one. And when you come after 2,024 years gone by and get baptized, you are also number one. Everyone in the church is number one. Because if Simon Peter was one, and then Andrew number two, and then Philip number three, then the Lord now has his own favorites. He is differentiating. It's now he's got a problem. But the Lord says, Simon 2,000 years and odd was number one, and you guys are all number one. You don't have any excuse or anything to come back with against me. I love you all equally. The way I love Simon, I love you. But the problem is our love back to him is not the same. That's where we become different. Some saints, some not so much saints. It all dependent on how much love we give back to the Lord Jesus. Now this, what I'm about to say is is in this church. Every church is slightly different, but in this church we have nine ranks. Piece of information. And why these nine ranks? Because these are the ranks of the angelic hosts. So the church has taken what is in heaven already. The, an the angels have nine ranks. The highest rank, cherubims. Second highest, seraphims followed by thrones, followed by dominions, followed by authorities, followed by powers, followed by municipalities, then archangels, and the last of the ranks, angels. Cherubims, the highest rank, equivalent on earth to a patriarch or a pope. Seraphims, archbishops. Thrones, like me, bishops slash good looking I had to rub it in a thrones bishops dominions what we call corpuscopy it's a priesthood rank but the highest authorities archdeacons powers priest municipalities deacons archangels subdeacons angels readers The main three ranks is deacon, priest, bishop. And each rank is divided into three. In the deaconhood, there is reader, subdeacon, deacon. That's three. In the priest, there is a priest, there is archdeacons, and there is corpuscopy, three. And in the bishop or the shepherdhood rank, there's a bishop, archbishop, and the patriarch or pope, three, 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 nine ranks. And these are the nine ranks in the angelic order cherubim seraphim thrones dominions authority powers municipalities archangels and angels when the when the angel fell 
and became Satan, far, far from all of you. That angel was from the highest rank, the cherubims. He was the highest rank. So from the highest rank to the lowest of all lows, gone with the wind to, to hell. And he will never come back. Out of the entire nine different ranks in the angelic order, only two ranks, no angel was lost of them. All the other ranks, they lost certain number of angels. Except two ranks, not even one angel was lost, was deceived by Satan. These two ranks that never lost any angels are the thrones, bishops, thank God. <laughs> are the thrones, bishops, and above them, seraphims. So seraphims and thrones, these are the only two ranks where they lost not even one angel to Satan. Why? Because what is the role of seraphims in heaven? All they do is just praise God 24-7, 365 days a year, nonstop. Seraphims, all they do is just pray. You see, angels have different roles, by the way. Some are peacemakers, some are chop headed. Uh, they chop heads. Head choppers. I was going to say chop headers. <laughs> you see, Archangel Gabriel is a peacemaker. Archangel Michael is a head chopper. So when Archangel Michael comes, Satan becomes a little mouse. He flees. Because Archangel Michael doesn't come and talk and negotiate. He comes and wipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if Archangel Michael appears now, you guys will be jumping from those windows. Uh, he's mighty. Huge figure, huh? Huge figure and massive wings. The ceiling is nothing. 20, 25 meters. Mighty. Yeah, mighty. Angels are very powerful, very powerful, extremely powerful. So the seraphims did not lose not even one angel. Why? Because all they do is pray. Thrones who are bishops, what is the throne? Throne is where the king sits. It is the chair of the king called throne. What is the Holy Bible trying to tell us? It's trying to say that when you let God rule over your life, sits as the king over your life thrones when you become his seat and he sits and conquers you and rules over your life and when your life is all about prayer satan cannot devour you when you pray and let god rule over your life you will step on satan but cherubims are full of knowledge wisdom but satan devoured them and took so many of that rank because it is not through your wisdom you protect yourself it is when god is enthroned on your life and your life becomes a prayer then you step on satan then you step on satan anyway enough of me talking because we need to make it to the hole very shortly so love the Lord and when you love the Lord you'll make him number one because the one you love is the number one in your life true you wake up the moment you open your eyes the, that the love of your life comes into your mind to your heart before your eyes who do you love the most is the one you think of the most if Christ is your love then you breathe him you live him is everything so when Christ is your life then wherever you go don't look for a big place because then you're trying to say to the Lord the place is gonna make you high no the Lord will be offended he will say sit wherever you sit at the gutter I'll make sure the gutter becomes number one this is why my beloved when 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 we go when when I go as a bishop somewhere 
if they have, if they have no chair for me, I'll sit on the, on the floor. If they have a chair and they say, sit, I'll sit. If they say, no, stay outside, I'll stay outside. If they say, come up on the altar, I'll come up. If they say, no, you need to sit with the people because you're one of them and you're not worthy to come on the altar, I'll sit wherever. Because it's not that person who called that's going to make me number one. The Lord has already made me number one before he even created you, my dear friend. I seek the Lord. That's why it doesn't bother me whether I'm accepted or rejected. <laughs> Whether I'm embraced or kicked out, who cares? I am in the church, in the gutter, in a cave, on top of a mountain, in, in, in hell, doesn't matter. When the Lord is with me, I'll say like King David and along with him, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, my love, Jesus Christ. If you were to answer one question, ask the Lord to help you answer this one. When he asks you, do you love me? You better say, you know, Lord, that I love you. When you're able to answer this question, your name is written in heaven. And then you step on Satan and you cast out demons. When the love of Christ engulfs you, the shortest sermon ever performed by the best looking bishop. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all, pour my Lord the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior and the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith in the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will to confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen.